Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I'm joined by physician and head of clinical product for Levels Health, Dr. Lauren Kelly Chu. We discuss the metabolic health crisis in America and the science of insulin resistance. This was an eye-opening conversation that I think you are going to really appreciate. So now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So happy to be here. I would really love it if you would take a minute to talk about the state of metabolic health in America and also provide us a little bit of the science behind insulin resistance and why this is kind of the fulcrum for so many disease states. So I think a a place to start is just to start by talking about what is metabolic health. And metabolism is really just the complex biologic cellular process that our bodies go through to convert the food we eat into fuel for our bodies. Our bodies are made up of about 37 trillion cells, and every cell needs energy to be able to do its function and to do it in a really smooth and efficient way. When all of this is working really elegantly and as it's meant to, we call that good metabolic health. Unfortunately, as you mentioned, there's a lot of dysfunction now in the way that this is happening in our bodies. And actually it's about nine out of 10 Americans have some aspect of metabolic dysfunction. So you figure almost everyone listening, probably this is affecting them in some way. Um, Knowing that many of your listeners are perhaps healthier than average, but it's kind um, of a scary statistic. It is. It is. And I think the other piece of that is that the vast majority have no idea. And so, and I can even say this from personal experience. I, my whole life was, am a runner, really exercise a lot, eat healthily, always had a really lean BMI. And I discovered in my early twenties that I had essentially a pre-diabetic blood sugar profile happening. And I had no idea. And in fact, if anyone had asked me, and and I was actually in medical school at the time. um, And if anyone had asked me, I would have said I was in perfect physical condition. So that's just one example of how kind of um, how how much this is happening without our awareness that it's happening. And, And so what really often is the beginning of metabolic dysfunction is continuously elevated blood sugar. And blood sugar is really just the result of the food we eat. And glucose is the most common form of energy for our cells, like I said, which then goes into the metabolic pathway. When you have continuously elevated blood sugar, which is often a result from eating processed foods or high sugar foods or carbs, and even healthy foods eaten in excess can result in in high levels of blood sugar, that then creates a state where the body needs to signal Um, that it needs to bring that blood sugar down in order to get it back into the healthy range. And that signal is done through the um, hormone insulin. And basically insulin says to the body, okay, we're out of range here and that's okay, but we need to bring sugar out of the blood and into the muscles, the liver. And if those are full into fat storage, this is actually, I think a really beautiful system that the body has to protect itself from the damage of high blood sugar. But if we're constantly in that state of high blood sugar, then we're constantly in a state of producing insulin. And so now we're in a, in a place where we have elevated insulin. And what happens when that happens is that the cells that are listening to that insulin signal eventually become less and less sensitive to that signal because it's always on, right? It's like if a parent rarely yells and they yell at a child, that child is going to listen, right? I, I don't condone this for parenting. I have three. Do you have kids? <laughs> No, not yet. (laughs) (laughs) You just hit home for a lot of people. (laughs) Yeah. So, but you know, if, if a parent is constantly yelling, that child then begins to think of that as the normal way that the parent communicates and it no longer will, the child will no longer respond, I think typically to that level of volume. And then when the parent really wants to get that response out of the child, they have to scream. That's what happens with insulin in the cells is when you have really good metabolic health, a little signal from insulin will pull blood sugar right out of the blood and bring the, your glucose numbers into normal range. But when you're constantly having insulin signaling, the cells start to say, well, I'm not really listening to that anymore. So then the body compensates by producing even more insulin, which is now the parents screaming. Um, and then the cells become even more resistant. That's insane. Yeah, I think a lot of people have this, they hear the word insulin and because of diabetes, it's like, oh, insulin's bad. And you're like, no, it's really anabolic. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a reason why it's a performance enhancing drug that elite athletes use inappropriately. But you're right. Um, it is, it's, I think 
our mind, I think, I don't think most people really understand the intricacy of how this is used to regulate our bodies. So when our body becomes insulin resistant, and now we're not getting the, um, you know, we have these pulses, our body isn't responding appropriately. What's the downstream effect? Oh, there's so many downstream effects. So ultimately what happens is that your ability to regulate your blood sugar goes down, which means that you are going to be having more of an experience of high blood of high blood sugar, as well as blood sugar dips. What this feels like in the short term is brain fog, fatigue, mood swings. You can see manifestations in the skin like acne or even wrinkles. The, the effects of high blood sugar actually impact collagen, which leads to wrinkles. Um, and I mentioned that only to say that for those who are motivated by aesthetic concerns, as well as, as concerns happening in the body, it's just a good example of you can see that happening on the outside, but you know that there's internal processes that are mirroring that that you can't see. So wow, I'm 41. So wrinkles are, are starting to become a real, real part of my life. That is fascinating. I never really thought about the skin, but with diabetics, if you look at their lower limbs, you see, uh, I mean, the tissue can necrose, can it? Mm, yeah. And, and there's, and there's nerve damage. And the interesting thing is there are really very few symptoms across the human experience that don't have some link to insulin resistance and metabolic health. And what this means is that in the long term. At this point, nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the US are linked to insulin resistance and metabolic health. And that just shows that there's this uniting theme across so many things, as you're mentioning, where metabolic health is at the root of it. So you look at things like cancer, heart disease, stroke, obesity, clearly diabetes, fertility through PCOS. I mean, it's just, it's an endless list. And, um, and the kind of amazing thing about it. And the exciting thing about it is that this is often induced by lifestyle and can also be reversed through lifestyle. Waking up exhausted and sore after a workout is not a badge of honor. It's actually a sign that you are overloading your body and in turn diminishing long-term health and fitness gains. My new app aim seven fixes this problem by turning wearable data into personalized exercise recommendations that layer on top of popular exercise programs. People already love like Apple fitness plus and Peloton and they prevent burnout and improve long-term fitness. Then we pick up where wearables fail, and we teach you how to fix your most pressing wellness issues, such as improving sleep, energy, and reducing stress. To get access to this exclusive program, go to www.aim7.com. That's A-I-M-7.com and sign up now. There are limited spots available each month, so sign up now and reserve your spot. Now, back to the show. Wow. So when did, when did we really start seeing the, this insulin resistance become elevated? Was there a certain like time, like if you're looking from a temporal standpoint, was this like in the 1960s and seventies, like when did this problem begin to really escalate? That is a really good question. And I actually will need to find the answer myself. I know that when you look at, for example, sugar consumption, we eat mm -hmm. about 10 times more sugar now than we did a hundred years ago. Uh, likewise, right now, about 60% of American calories are coming from ultra processed food. And this is a significant change over the last 50 years. Um, and, and, and I think the interesting thing going back to in insulin is you can actually start to see signs of insulin resistance long before you see glucose numbers going out of whack in terms of the typical glucose testing, such as fasting glucose. So, so what are some of those signs? Right. So, so the first thing I guess I would say is just to back up when, when you look at fasting glucose, which is the common screen for prediabetes and diabetes in the traditional healthcare system. The, I think the misconception is that many people get those back, including at different times, myself and my family members. And you see it's in the normal range for traditional healthcare, right? That's like less than hundred typically on a fasting glucose. But the reality is that the amount of insulin that the body needs to create to keep your blood sugar in that range can be widely, wildly different. For example, you might have a fasting glucose of 85 and you're producing a very small amount of insulin to keep it there. And I might also have a fasting glucose of 85, but I have to produce a ton of insulin to keep it there. So those changes in your metabolic function are happening long before you see the glucose levels change. I got a question for you. So mm -hmm. the normative range, like you're supposed to be like what below 99 for resting blood glucose. So if I'm at 90, Okay. But I have very low insulin. Is that, is that better than being at 70 with a little bit higher insulin? So I would, I would start by saying every body is unique and everyone's physiology yeah. is unique. I think the overall goal is to see a fasting glucose somewhere in the 
call it low mid seventies to low eighties with mm-hmm. as low uh, fasting insulin as possible, which is to say you're in this optimal range of blood sugar and you're not having to work too hard to keep it there. Um, I actually think, you know, you mentioned the 99 and below. I think this is something that I'd really like to see change in the way that the healthcare system deals with this, which is that we have these across all our lab testing, we have these arbitrary cutoffs where we're like, if it's 99 or below, it's fine. If it's 101, you're pre-diabetic. That doesn't make any sense. To your point, a fasting glucose of 90 is different than a fasting glucose of 80, which is different than a fasting glucose of 99. It's a spectrum, right? And we move across the spectrum of metabolic health. And so um, I think increasingly, we need to start thinking of this as, as a continuum rather than a cutoff. I love that. Um, when I was, I worked at the NFL as a sports scientist and um, I got really interested in vision because in sports, like if you can't see like game over, you can be fast and have all these other things. Well, I used to work with Nike's with Nike for about five years. And I met this gentleman who built Nike's performance vision lab. And I'm, I'm going to get to a point here. That's going to relate to oh, this topic. This. Um, and I found out from him that the Snellen eye chart, that you go to, you know, your doctor's office was developed during the civil war. And there is zero scientific literature to say 2020 is exactly where you should be seeing. As a matter of fact, most elite athletes in baseball that hit over 300 can see 2015 or better. And so we had athletes that were playing at the highest level and we brought them in. We set up this like makeshift vision lab and we're testing. And we found guys that were like 2050. And as soon as we remediated them down and then we had to train some things, all of a sudden their performance like changed dramatically. And so as I'm thinking about this, how many of these different biomarker ranges need to be reevaluated and maybe looked at from a system approach, like how they're interacting and then maybe by age or age ranges, or I mean, I don't know if ethnicity plays a role in this, but I'd love to toss that back into your court. Yes, to all of that. That's fascinating about the eye chart. Um, There are so many aspects of this when it comes to to health testing. So to answer your first question, I think almost everything probably needs to be reevaluated when it comes to benchmarks. And this is some of the work that Levels is doing along with our advisory board is to figure out what actual benchmarks make sense and where do we have the research to support that already? And in what areas do we need to do research? Because I think something that is not as recognized now that needs to be is that there is just not enough research on some of these metabolic health markers. For example, fasting insulin. There has not been nearly enough research on what that should be, in part because in general, primary care doctors are not testing fasting insulin. So, right, like if you get a normal panel at your annual checkup, I would highly, highly doubt there's fasting insulin on top of that. And even worse in my mind is if you get a fasting glucose back and let's say it's 97 they will not follow in general. The protocol is not to follow up with the fasting insulin. The protocol is to say everything is great and you're fine. And actually that's right, which, which is almost more damaging in my mind than the other people. Because at that point, now you're like, I can keep doing what I'm doing. So it's actually encouraging you to continue forward when you're clearly moving towards prediabetes. It's a tiny snapshot. Exactly. And so I think what we're going to talk about in our next episode is, is like how using continuous wearables. So for instance, sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Like that was my, that's where my doctoral work was in. Um, and now you can like, now with these wearables, we can start going, Oh, like we can capture sleep. I think soon we'll be able to look at sleep stages. Um, you know, there's some good AI coming out with that, but like now you can start instead of just your perception, your perception of normal can be really bad and you don't even know what good feels like. And so that's, what's really exciting about what levels is doing is now we have the capability of monitoring these things, 24 seven, and it can bring to light, you know, things that we just didn't even know exist. And then you could pipe that information to your doctor Mm -hmm. and then she could look at this and go, Oh my goodness, like (laughs) we need to do some real work here. Um, so I'm excited to talk about that in our next episode. So thank you so much for joining us today and you better tune into that one. If you know somebody that would benefit from the information that Dr. Kelly Chu shared today, would you please consider sharing this episode with them? And if you want to support the show, please leave us a comment and a review on the Apple Podcast app. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you on the next episode.